Hi, this is Stuart Knockbar with Educated Quest. With me today is Pam Bothman. She is the Director of Admissions and Center at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. This liberal arts college is one of the noted colleges that changes lives, but it also is noted for many, many things. And Pam and I are going to talk about them today. Among them is that years and years ago when college football uh, was in its beginnings, and small colleges played big schools, and Ivies were big schools, Center College beat Harvard in a football game. And I'm sure Pam, who is a Center College alum, will tell us that Center College might be better than Harvard for prospective students in some different ways. So Pam, thank you for joining me today, and happy Thanksgiving. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, and yes, we do have a building on campus um, with some spray painting of C6HO um, to celebrate our, our win over Harvard. And no one thinks it's a chemical equation or yeah. a compound of something or anything like that? Uh, if they're thinking that it's both, then we've done our work. <laughs> now, what, now, tell me a little bit about Center. How many undergrads go to Center College? We have right around 1,450 undergraduate students right now, and we're 98% residential. So the students who make Center their home live with us, study with us. It's a complete comprehensive experience for them. Now, there's Greek life on campus, too? Yes, sir. We, um, we do um, have a Greek system here. We have deferred recruitment. So for students who are getting used to a residential college environment, we want them to get used to their classes, their schedule, and then if they want to explore uh, the Greek system of fraternities and sororities, they would do that in February. And that allows for students to really kind of get their footing as college students and then think about expanding their social circle. Um, we've got a lot of philanthropic activities, a lot of academic support, as well as a social uh, function uh, for those groups. Now, do the, Greeks, do the Greek organizations have their own houses? That's a great question. We do have houses, but they only hold about 10 people per organization. And the idea behind that is to give the group some autonomy for their business practices, their leadership teams. Uh, but we want students to really intermingle and um, have a very inclusive feel on campus. Um, so you're gonna find students will be living together. Um, lots of different organizations are kind of intermingling and commingling on campus in the residence halls. Uh, but we do want them to have some space, some individual space, but, um, but our students are going to eat together in our dining hall. Um, they're not going to go off to one area and just kind of study and socialize only within that group. How, how many freshmen um, come in every year? Um, we are having classes somewhere between about 370 to 400. And um, some of this is dependent upon our study abroad programs and how many students will be abroad and how many available residential hall uh, spaces we have. So it can fluctuate just a little bit, but uh, incoming classes are right around sort of that mark between 370 to 400. Was your current class about that size even during the pandemic? It was. We were a little bit on the lower side, um, but it turned out to be beneficial because a number of the students that intended to go study abroad were not able to do so. So we were able to house the students who wanted to be on campus for the fall. And we did um, open up in person. Uh, we taught courses this fall in a hybrid fashion where some were online, um, but we tried to be in person in a really safe way for as many students who wanted to go to class and interact with their peers and their professors, again, in the safest manner possible. But we, we facilitated, I think, a pretty good fall experience for our students. Did um, the, the college have to de-densify um, housing? Um, we were able to kind of, we've been pretty aggressive with testing. And so um, our aggressive testing process has allowed us to have students kind of um, interact in pod settings. So they kind of got in these families. And um, so they've allowed, we've allowed them to have double occupancy rooms. Um, we have had spaces on campus where any student who was, um, who tested positive 
for COVID or um, came into contact with somebody who did, we were able to quarantine and isolate students pretty quickly. Um, so I think we managed in a really safe way while letting students still have as much of kind of a normal residential college experience as possible, as far as I'm um, interacting with a roommate, some hallmates, that kind of thing. Was the dining experience as close to normal as possible? No, not, not like we kind of treasure. Um, our dining hall is called Cowan, and we've always kind of um, embraced the concept of family style dining. Um, so we have lots of round tables. We, we have students refer to a phenomenon called Cowan sit, where in a normal uh, year, you might waste more time just um, socially, socializing and casually chatting in the dining hall. Uh, we weren't able to do that, but we were able to use the residence hall and have our students um, go and get their carry out food in a really safe way. They can eat outside, they can um, spread out in different spaces, um, but that sort of dynamic of where students try to pack 12 students around a table and you have all this buzz and this chatter, um, you know, during meal time um, is something that we've actually really missed. And I'm looking forward to the days of when we can go back to that kind of high energy, very inclusive family style dining atmosphere. And, and where did athletics uh, play out this fall? We uh, tried to um, give our student athletes an experience. We were not able to have competition in the same way, but we had some phases where um, we allowed students to do some training and then some practicing and some inner squad scrimmages. Um, and that, that it, you know, of course it didn't, it wasn't a great substitute for the com competition that you like. Um, but I do think it was nice for our athletes to still have a sense of team bonding, still have some uh, physical exercise and have that outlet and still stay skilled and um, be given an opportunity to work on their craft. Um, our conference is, we're in the Southern Collegiate Athletic Conference. Our conference does involve some travel to the Southeast. So, um, you know, we just weren't able to, to do any of that kind of um, those kinds of travel experiences. But I think the team bonding and that sense of um, structure to a day and having an out, a physical outlet, we, we found that to be valuable, try to facilitate as much of that as we could in a safe way. From your perspective in your role now, mm -hmm. and as an alumnus, and you're a mother of, uh, of someone who, who goes here as well, what from the academic side makes Center stand out from other schools that kids consider? Um, I really feel like access is kind of key. A lot of places will talk about study abroad programs or internships or research, and um, which it's great to have all those opportunities, but sometimes um, the student has to take more of a lead in initiating those kinds of experiences. And for us, we're kind of in our students' faces about, you know, this is how you do this. And we're reaching out to students to make sure they're aware of the study abroad um, experiences are accessible. Um, there's, we can help you with some funding. We can help you get the paperwork you need to travel internationally. We can help you with the travel aspect of it. And you're gonna go travel with center people. You're gonna go with faculty members who know that area well. So for students who are intimidated by experience such as um, you know, planning an internship or planning a study abroad experience, we're gonna have our people in place to help facilitate a lot of that. Um, so I think um, the accessibility of it and the ease of planning is um, something that I don't, I don't take for granted because I don't know that it's that easily planned at every school. Um, so I've come to really appreciate that in the planning we have here. We have a program called the Center Commitment where we guarantee students they can study abroad, they can complete an internship or a research project and graduate in four years. And if even one of those three things does not happen for a student, we pay for the fifth year or the fifth term of tuition. So even if they had a, all of their credits mm -hmm. and didn't get to go abroad, they mm -hmm. could do a year's worth of credits towards another major or something? They could. 
if, if they didn't get to take advantage of study abroad, interning or research, um, we'll go ahead and we'll pay for that fifth term or that fifth year. If it's been our, you know, if it's a scheduling conflict or students been, um, you know, they've been shut out of a program or a, a class or anything like that. It's not, um, for us, it's we want students to really explore. And so we are starting with students when they're first year students to really enlighten them about packing everything they can into their four year experience. So we have sophomores who go abroad. We have sophomores who do internships. Um, you don't, it's not just reserved for upper class students. Um, and I think that allows our students to make better choices about majors and minors, um, career paths. But I also think when students take advantage of those kinds of experiences early in their college career, they're more adventurous and they take better advantage of what we have in Danville and on campus because they have a sense of confidence about them that's developed by a new experience like that. Let me take uh, two points you just made. One about majors and minors. Is it, for, is it quite common for students at Center to have more than one major or maybe more than one minor? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. We um, have about 25% of our students who double major. Um, we have a good number who will major and double minor. And um, we also have, for instance, um, we do language scholarships and we also do performing arts scholarships. So if you're interested in pursuing languages or if you're interested in pursuing uh, technical theater, um, performance, drama, um, or music, you can still do that and not have to be a major or a minor. Um, so sometimes students will start exploring some of those areas and they get far enough along and they're like, oh, I might as well just minor now that I'm this far along um, with music or drama or maybe Spanish or something like that. Um, so we find students start kind of piecing together a number of different things. And that's the other thing I would add is, I don't think any two center students leave having had the exact same experience just by virtue of being able to pull in different experiences that are really tailored to the student's interests. Um, I think um, they just leave with a very personalized um, undergraduate degree. When, when you're reviewing applications, is intended major important in the decision? Not really. Um, we don't ask students to declare majors and minors until spring of the sophomore year. So um, it's important from a perspective of, I wanna make sure when I'm working with a student, they know what they need to know um, about their academic passions and interests, but we're not really taking that into account for any evaluative measure. So if somebody said, I don't know what I wanna major in, and, but they, they, they weren't happy with, let's say the science course they took in high school. However, they, you know what, they like biology. Uh, you know, for they've learned about things on their own. They want to take biology in college. There's no obstacles, you know, in the reg in taking the class. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we um, have just recently changed our general education uh, curriculum a little bit, and so we do want students to explore. So the first year and a half is really designed for students to kind of. Um, have a college introduction to different disciplines because sometimes the way it's delivered to you in college is very different in high school. And um, I'm a perfect example. I hated history when I was in high school. I just, I found it boring. I didn't like the timelines. It was presented to me in a really dry manner. Um, and when I came to center, I took a history class with um, sort of a legendary professor. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And then just kept taking history classes and ended up, you know, sort of a lover of history just by virtue of how it was delivered to me in a much more exciting and kind of a storytelling kind of way. Well, given, um, and in Danville, how, mm -hmm. how, talk about a little bit, how do students, do students go into town? Or can they work, do internships in the community? Can they do volunteer work in the community? I'm glad you asked that because this is an area where we are enhancing the relationship we have with Danville. We are starting, we're opening a program called CenterWorks and it actually has a physical space in downtown. And the idea is that we want to um, help students sort of develop an entrepreneurial spirit. 
Um, they don't have to be economics majors. This can be for the art student who has a fantastic idea, um, but we also want to introduce our students to different people in town and in the region. And so the CenterWorks program is gonna allow students to work towards some um, certification and they're gonna be able to uh, go into joint ventures with entrepreneurs from Danville and the larger Commonwealth area. And so I'm really excited about that. And um, the physical space is coming along. We're not quite in that space yet, but um, folks can go online and kind of see what the graphics are gonna um, present and uh, the visuals for that and the vision. Um, the other thing I would add is we also have a very uh, robust service program. We're what's called a Bonner School. Um, so we um, have the Bonner Scholars and Bonner Leaders Program, and this would be for students who are very dedicated to service. And um, we have a number of avenues for students to plug into different philanthropic and service activities in the Danville area. And so I think that really allows us to bond with Danville and the people of the community in a really nice way. Now, I live in New Jersey. There are schools that participate in the Bonner Scholars, and there's a financial aid component or a stipend component to that, as well as the, pro the community service component to it. There, from what I read about Center um, before our conversation, there's different kinds of scholars programs and scholarship programs, starting with the Bonner. Can you walk me through some of them? Absolutely. Um, we, have, we have three categories of scholarships. We have the General Merit Scholarship Program, and um, students don't have to apply you know, specifically for those. If a student applies for admission, and is accepted, a student gets automatic consideration for general merit scholarships and they start at 5,000 per year and they go all the way up to 29,000 per year. And those are four year renewable. Then we have a, a category called special scholarships and the Bonner scholarship would fall in this category. And these scholarships target very specific areas. For instance, the Bonner program is for students who are very dedicated to serving others, matters of social justice and um, access and equity and so forth. And so students, uh, we have two versions of that though. We have a Bonner Scholars Program, which does have a need-based aid component to it. And then we also have a Bonner Leaders Program because we had a number of students who wanted to still pursue this great opportunity, but may not meet the specifications for the need-based um, resources. So that's one. We also have, um, as I mentioned before, the language scholarships and performing arts scholarships, and those can be stacked on other scholarships, and they range from 3,000 to 5,000 per year. And again, students do not have to major or minor to be a recipient of those. Is there a GPA requirement on any of these awards? No, not for these. So now, for, for the good. general ones, for the different level, there are different GPA requirements in order to maintain those. And what would be the hardest to keep in terms, um, of, in terms of a GPA? Well, let me, we'll go to Premier Scholarships, and those will be the most competitive, and those will have the highest GPA to maintain. Um, mm -hmm. Let me, there's one more special scholarship I want to highlight oh, okay. um, called the New Horizons Program. And this would be for students who are dedicated to uh, diversity, leadership, service, inclusion. Um, and it is a really wonderful scholarship program with some mentoring in that and some group dynamics. Um, so that's also a really great opportunity. So those would be the special ones. The third category would be our premier scholarships. And for a school of our size, we're really fortunate that we offer three a full ride um, or full tuition plus scholarships. And the Brown Fellows Program would be for our most academically curious students, um, very accomplished students. Um, that is a full ride plus enrichment experience and we offer 10 Brown Fellowships a year. Then we have the Lincoln Scholars Program, which is our newest scholarship, and we offer 10 of these a year. And this would be also a full ride plus enrichment experiences for students who have the capacity and the desire to change the world for good. And this is in honor of, of Abraham Lincoln. 
And then we have a first generation scholarship program called the Grissom Scholars Program, which um, has a wonderful mentoring component to it, but it is a full tuition plus enrichment experience for students with a very strong need-based financial aid um, element to that as well. So we offer 30 either full tuition or full ride scholarships to the incoming class every year. Um, so I feel really fortunate that we have um, this variety and the number of the scholarship programs that we do. Given the variety that you just talked about, aside from the scholarships, what makes somebody say yes? Mm. I think there are a couple different things. Um, I think it boils down often to um, to the sense of community, which I, I'm sure that's a little bit of a cliche for a number of schools, but I, I really feel like, you know, we have teaching faculty members here and teaching is their passion and it's what they do. And I think throughout the recruitment process, our students will really get connected to some faculty members, um, folks on the admission staff, if they're working with a coach or a team or if they are pursuing a musical program. Um, I think knowing that they have a lot of different ways to stay engaged academically, but also extracurricularly and personally is really appealing for our students. Um, I think our students are very much kind of liberal artsy in their extracurricular um, endeavors as well. It's really common for us to have you know, a physics major who still wants to sing in a musical group or um, our football quarterback uh, a handful of years ago um, was a drama. He had the lead in the plays. Um, so he was equally gifted um, on the stage as he was on the football field. Um, so I think the variety of what you can do and the skills you can develop and the interests that you can foster is really appealing. Now, if you're getting students from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, what schools have they typically been considering? Um, it, it will often depend on if a student's a recruited athlete um, sometimes, but um, I would think school, students from the Northeast are going to look at Grinnell, um, be looking at places maybe like Kenyon, different schools like that. If they're seeking um, warmer climate, um, they might be considering schools like Davidson, Furman, Vanderbilt. Um, they would look at maybe Rhodes, uh, Sewanee, schools of that nature. Was there ever a creative message that someone had to send to that swayed someone one way or towards you? Oh, um, like talking about the average temperature in Danville, Kentucky. And yeah, December. I was trying to think of some. Wait, I'll tell you what we did last year is um, when the pandemic hit, we had a coloring book that was made that was all center, <laughs> center drawings and illustrations. And we got really great feedback because I think it was really soothing at a time that was really stressful. So I think um, it was very centery. It was, um, I think, really thoughtful in that you know, it was really not anything, it wasn't transactional. We didn't want anybody to do anything. We just wanted people to have a moment to take a deep breath and relax. So, um, so I'd say that was kind of a creative message we shared. Um, it wasn't to any specific student perhaps, but I think it was, um, it was well received by a, a really anxious group of seniors who were trying to figure out how to pick a college home at the beginning of a pandemic. Is there a misconception about Kentucky uh, and uh, that's been that's been spread around here that you want to refute? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think oftentimes Kentucky doesn't get a lot of credit for being a sophisticated place. And um, I do feel like um, our campus has a fair amount of sophistication in that we have a world-class performing arts facility and we bring in international and national performers to campus and um, those speakers and those performers are free for center students. And I think um, the fact that we are thinking about preparing students for really a global world is just ingrained in everything we do here. So um, Danville itself is a really lovely place. It's um, a safe place. We have a nice relationship between um, you know, center and, and Danville. It's not New York where you're not gonna have 
you know, a lot of the buzz in that respect, but you're going to have um, some charm balanced with some innovation. Um, and I think it's a really nice backdrop for students who really want to focus on growing into who they're going to be. Um, not a lot of distractions. You're not worried about campus safety. You're, you're, you're living your life. You're trying to become the best version of yourself with people who are really invested in you. Have you gotten questions from parents and prospective students that you would not be asked if there was no pandemic? Um, well, you know, we do get a lot of questions about testing, um, the, the health um, and testing in that respect. Um, we, for years, have worked with families if they have had a financial adjustment midstream. Um, so I think families asking about um, how does my financial aid change if I, you know, have a change in employment, that's not necessarily new for us. We've been working with families um, for years in that respect. Um, I think most of it has, has been around the testing um, aspect. And uh, we've been pretty aggressive about it. Um, aggressive meaning um, very diligent about it, not aggressive in how we're testing people. Nobody wants an aggressive <laughs> COVID test at this point. Do you, do you think a community that's small like yours is at an advantage right now during the pandemic? Because you can sort of, you can get everyone together and everyone is on campus. I have to give our students a lot of credit. They were involved in the development of the social contract that we asked everyone to both sign and observe if they return to campus. And um, it hasn't been easy. You know, I know that COVID fatigue is real and um, our students have gotten weary and we've tried to facilitate some fun um, things like we've had some puppies on campus where people could um, from a safe distance have a moment to kind of just enjoy loving on a puppy. Um, you know, we've, we've done some things out on the football field for some social interactions. Um, we've tried to do some pumpkin carving or decorating and things like that, but it just isn't the same as being able to have those normal kind of experiences that um, you kind of, the traditional things that students come to really appreciate. Um, you know, we haven't been able to all gather for homecoming. Um, so I know they've missed out on some things, but our students have been really, really fantastic through this entire thing. And I think they're the reason uh, by observing those measures that we've been able to stay here the whole term um, and really manage um, any, any kind of positive cases and get things um, handled quickly and students who've gone into quarantine have, have been great about observing what they need to do there and not really pushing the limit. Now there were some adjustments for classes this term. You, you took like two classes at a time or something like that? We, d we did. When we uh, were planning, we weren't 100% sure if there might be a time like um, we all experienced in the spring where everybody had to kind of close up and send students home. And so we learned from the spring or we assumed that it might be easier in that setting to manage two classes instead of four. So what we did is we had two blocks of uh, two course loads. So you would take two classes for about six and a half weeks. We had a very short break of a couple days and then we went into the two class schedule and then we'll be uh, bidding our students farewell in the next week right before Thanksgiving and then they'll have a little bit of an extended break at home. And, um, and we learned some things were great about that, some things were challenging about that. And so our hope is to resume the typical spring schedule we have um, where students will take four classes over a course of about 13 weeks. Uh, but again, um, as I said to you earlier before we got started, our theme this year has been Max Flex. <laughs> so um, we're problem solving, we are making adjustments as we need, and um, we're planning in a way um, that's really optimistic and hopeful, but we're prepared to make any adjustment that we need to. Now, will everyone go home for Thanksgiving and not come back until January? 
that is the plan with the exception of some cases for instance we have some international students who won't be able to go home and we'll make their stay here as comfortable as we can over the break um, but for the um, good majority of our students i think um, most are ready to get home for a little bit you know they they want to go home they haven't been able to see their families over the break because most have stayed on campus they haven't gone home for a fall break um, so they're ready to go home relax enjoy thanksgiving with their family enjoy the holidays and then we hope they're returning to us in January rejuvenated um, in that we've got um, kind of light at the end of the tunnel for all of the adjustments we would need to make for the pandemic. Now they took finals in two classes because they ended in mm -hmm. six weeks. Right. Did they, uh, did they take finals in the other two before they leave for Thanksgiving? That's what we'll be doing. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so they're going to be gone from Thanksgiving just before Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. till the beginning of your January term. Right. Now, isn't isn't there normally a term in between fall and spring? Yeah, you have a, a good memory. Um, we have what we call center term, and that's actually in January. So when students return to us, they'll return for center term where they only focus on one class. Okay. And um, that will ease them back in. The center term classes are designed to be a little bit more creative in nature. And um, it might be a topic that a professor would want to dedicate maybe three weeks to, but not, not three months. Um, and that has typically been a time where we send a number of students abroad. Um, but again, we've made adjustments for that because um, there are those limitations we need to consider. My um, oldest son, who graduated from center in May of 2020, he spent last winter in Finland. Um, so he got back um, a couple weeks before everything started to, um, to get a little bit more complicated, but he had time of his life. Um, it was a transformational, really um, memorable experience that um, we're just incredibly grateful he was able to have. Now, alumni call themselves the Center Mafia, I think. <laughs> we're, we're a pretty tight-knit group. Um, you may not have anything in common with a center alum, except for the fact that you find out you both went to center and there will be an immediate bond. Um, we do a lot of networking. Um, our alums are fantastic about helping our students with internships and job placement and writing references and, and making connections. And um, it's one of those things that I think um, as I've gotten older, um, I really, really look back at how the connections that, not that you really take for granted, but you know are always there. For instance, there's a, a gentleman in Louisville who is a really great resource for me. And anytime I have an economics student who wants to do a, a really solid internship that might lead to a, a job, I can contact him um, and say, hey, would you talk to this student? And, and even though the student may not want to be in Louisville, the company for which this alum works is is national so he can then direct them to some other places and so um he is one of my go-to's and um i realize i have quite a few of those which um which is a really fantastic thing great resource now do students come out that i would imagine a school of your size a lot of students are athletes and in a, in a normal time do students cheer for other students or do you find that they're watching Kentucky play basketball on TV or Louisville um, play basketball on TV? 42% 40, of our students participate in varsity athletics. And I actually think it was closer to 45% for the incoming class. Um, we, we do have a good tradition here. Um, we're in an athletic conference that really um, embraces the concept of the student athlete and the way our travel is typically set up it allows for students to be fully immersed in their academic life and then have their outlet for athletics so uh, so we want to compete uh, when we're on the the field the court um, whatever it may be in the pool um, so our students have i think a really healthy balance between academics and athletics and i think our non-athletes um, they enjoy intramural sports, but they're also really great about having, you know, there's a fan base for different sports that will kind of um, move around. And um, it's, 
Saturday afternoons are always really great here um, in the fall, typically when we're not dealing with a pandemic where you can kind of maneuver between the soccer game, the field hockey game, and then go catch part of the football game. And um, you find students really kind of enjoy that experience for sure. Is there optimism on campus or within the community that things will be closer than they were before the pandemic because of everything all of you have learned? Oh, you know, um, hindsight's always twenty twenty, And, um, you know, I think people are, have really learned what they have missed. And um, I think when given the opportunity to re-engage in the dining hall and cram 12 chairs around that table, our students will do that with um, a greater appreciation and maybe more mindfulness about that. Um, I do think our students have been really, um, really fantastic about reaching out to other students now in safe ways. I know um, there have been a lot of Zoom conversations and I think students have been a little bit more mindful of looking out for their friends and their classmates to see if someone's struggling or someone needs a little extra assistance. So um, I think there'll be a lot of good that comes out of this. It's been complex and it's been challenging at times, but I, I feel like there will be a lot of good that comes and results from having had this experience. I think it'll make us stronger. Well, the social contract um, that what you mentioned earlier, is that going to continue on in some way? I, I expect that we will, for certain have um, a social contract um, in the winter and in the spring. Um, what we did with the social contract is, you know, we started in a more strict manner. And as we were able to either ease up, um, we would work with students on how we did that. And if we had to tighten back up, we would do that. So um, it'll remain in effect, I imagine, but we'll be somewhat fluid to allow for any advancements, um, any progress we make, you know, as a community um, health wise. What exactly does it say? Does it say people will be courteous and good people? Or, I mean, I read a thing about Ohio State athletes mm -hmm. where they said that oh, they were going to absolve them from blame, the university from blame. I don't think you're, 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 you're contract goes in a direction like that no our contract is asking people to be socially responsible and that um, there's mask wearing you're observing social distancing you are not socializing in groups of a certain number or greater um, you're not being irresponsible about uh, socializing you're not going to places um, outside of our kind of immediate area you're not going I would say like a concert venue, although they're not things like that, but something that might be risky um, in returning without doing the proper measures. Now, if a student needed to go home because uh, there's a family funeral or something like that, we definitely are working with students on individual circumstances, but when they return, there's some testing that goes on and there's some measures just so that we can protect the health and the safety of our, of our community members. Well, it, sound, it sounds to me like you're really trying to, you're holding a community together very well. And it sounds like you're trying to keep as many things as close to normal as, 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 they, as they can possibly be. Could a, could a school twice your size or a University of Kentucky ever try, attempt to do anything like that? I, I kind of doubt it. I kind of think he you're being small has an advantage here. Um, I, I do think being small has been um, beneficial for us. Um, I also think that um, you have to dedicate resources to it. Um, you know, we, we did make a decision to, to have this regular testing plan and, and that requires you to dedicate some of your financial resources to that. So some places are gonna be limited and not have the opportunity to do that. But um, I'm grateful that that was a priority for us and we, we figured out how to incorporate that into all of our safety um, guidelines and, and expectations. Last question. For all that um, we've discussed and all that Center College does, who would be the person, the prospective student most likely to succeed? I think a student who wants to take an active role 
in their, their academic growth, um, their social growth, their, their personal growth. I think students who want a seat at the table to be involved in the conversation, to have a participatory role, are students who really flourish here. And um, I don't know that it's any one profile or any one background, but I think students who are willing to take the help that's offered um, are the students who, who really kind of latch on to what this whole residential close-knit dynamic really is. And um, my, I'll use my son as an example. My, my son came from a county high school in Kentucky, a, a mid-size school, um, had a good experience and came here and took an economics class in fall term of his first year and it changed everything. He decided at that moment that was it. I think previously he was leaning toward chemistry, came here. He is in close contact with his professors that he had. Um, he, he has developed relationships in ways that I know they've changed him. Um, but he was open to that. And I know Mike Fabridius, he's a retired professor at this point, but Mike Fabridius became kind of a life mentor to my oldest son, Jackson, and um, the friendship they've developed now is something that I think is, um, it's really special. And um, so I think students who, who go in and they sit down with that professor and they realize this person's really interested in me, not just for what I'm doing in the classroom, but everything else, um, those students are the students who get the most out of this kind of experience. Pam, thank you very much for, for your time. This yeah. is one college that tries to do everything that anyone would hope a, a small private liberal arts college would do. And it's a privilege to have a chance to talk to you about it. Well, I consider it an honor that you reached out to even have this conversation. And, um, and I appreciate your very kind comments. Um, I feel really fortunate to be connected with Center. I, I do think we're a pretty special place. I think we're kind of a gem. And um, in that students who want to get connected with us, I think are really pleasantly surprised by the variety of opportunities, the ease of access, and sort of how they can push the envelope. Thank you. Great, thank you, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.